Face at 12. The 6 o'clock news starts right now. The midterm election is here and we are now an hour away from polls closing and hopefully not long after that we will see election results coming in. Yeah, there's key races out there that could change the look of not only Bear County, but the state and the nation as a whole. And we have crews all over the city and the state keeping an eye on those city, county and Texas races and covering the race for Bear County judge today. We have our Dylan Collier at Democratic candidate Judge Peter Sakai's watch party tonight. Garrett Berger with Republican candidate Trish DeBerry and our Patty Santos outside Bear County election headquarters, a very busy headquarters today where officials dealt with a short lived power outage in North Bear County. So Patty, we're going to start with you. How much did that outage impact the polling locations there? Well, that outage was out within about 30 minutes or so, so things got right back on. But there was also a backup um, batteries that those polling locations had, so hopefully nothing uh, that really slowed anything down. But we do know that an average of 11,000 people are voting uh, here in Bear County, and that is a lot of people and also a lot of emotions that election officials have to deal with. We know that there was a small issue today at Chavano Park Police that handled earlier today. A person was yelling and costing a scene outside City Hall. Uh, that is where where people were casting their vote. The person did leave after police arrived and Bear County Sheriff's Office officials are in charge of polling location security and they say there have been no issues reported. Nearly 111,000 people have voted on election day. Some locations have been busier than others. So make sure that you will have an actual photo ID to make sure your voting process is fast and easy and be kind to poll workers because they're dealing with everyone's complaints. We are getting a lot of complaints, well, definitely. Um, you know, people are complaining if they have to wait in line. People are complaining if they have to update their address. Uh, and if it takes them any longer, if they have to move to the side to fill out any other paperwork, um, they're angry. Of course, there's just a lot of emotion out there. And election official leaders tell us any technical issues that have come up, they have been able to deal with quickly. Polls close at 7, but if you take a look behind me right here, you can see it's pretty busy. As long as you are standing in line by 7 o'clock, you will get to vote. So make sure that you are patient and maybe try a polling location that's not as busy. We'll send it back to you. Big thanks to all those election workers making this happen today. Thank you, Patty, as well. Now to the race for Bear County Judge with longtime Judge Nelson Wolf stepping down. That seat is wide open for the first time in two decades. Garrett Berger joins us live from Alamo Heights, where he talked with Republican Trish DeBerry, who took a leap of faith here, Garrett, that there may be a Republican path to victory. So how's she feeling today? Absolutely. We spoke with Trish DeBerry just and just within the past hour at her home nearby. Now, she says she is feeling good about her chances and points to what she says is good turnout in a Republican territory. Still, she is open with the fact that she has taken a risk here in running for county judge. A longtime PR specialist, DeBerry was a first term county commissioner less than a year in when she decided to run for the county judge's seat. She was the lone Republican on the dais at the time in a county that traditionally goes Democrat. But DeBerry says she never thought she would be in that seat for 12 or 20 years. Instead, she says she wanted to make a difference and thinks she did that as her commissioner. So when I looked at the environment regarding Joe Biden's you know, numbers regarding his approval ratings, when I looked at gas prices, when I looked at the environment regarding inflation and the economy, um, everything told me this was a ripe environment for a Republican to run. Her campaign has had a rough road recently, garnering criticism for things like blaming a local attorney and his ad man without evidence of, his, of being behind dark money attack ads against her and for calling her opponent, Peter Sakai, Dr. No during a debate which an Asian advocacy group said was racist because of its reference to a half Asian Bond villain. Now, DeBerry still thinks her campaign has set the plat has framed the platform in this race, talking about issues from whether or not to move the Bear County Jail or whether the, ca whether the county should have more of a say in the city owned utilities. With just an hour left for the polls open, polls open and people able to vote, we're going to have an idea very soon about whether or not those views align with Bear County voters. Live in Alamo Heights, I'm Garrett Berger, 
JSAT 12 News. Thank you, Garrett. Of course, it's a race we're following very closely to the other side of the ticket now. Judge Peter Sakai, he believes his long career as a children's court judge has set him up to lead Bear County and its 1500 employees. Dylan Collier live at Sakai's Northwest Side watch party for what could be an exciting night for the Democrat. You sense there's some confidence there, do you not, Dylan? I certainly do, Steve, and this is an example of contrasting styles of how to run a campaign. As Garrett mentioned, Sakai's opponent, Trisha Berry, tried to link Sakai to those dark money attack ads without ever providing evidence. She then was accused of repeatedly using a racially insensitive slur to refer to her opponent at candidate forums. Sakai, meanwhile, has taken a different route and try to avoid the noise as much as possible. He says this is a race about improving county government, making it a better place to work, and making its departments more efficient. A long road of campaigning, nearly one full year since he announced that he would run for county judge, has led Peter Sakai to this moment. We were attacked in the primary and we got attacked again in the general election, but I'm proud that my a team, my campaign team, stayed positive. Uh, we committed to make sure that we talked about the issues and we just really let the negative campaign just be, be a side issue. Other obstacles that Judge Sakai hopes to overcome if he's elected is to speed up the judicial process in Bear County. That's something he knows all about. And then also improving emergency health services for people living in the unincorporated parts of Bear County. He is expected to arrive here at the House of Nizam on the northwest side sometime within the 7 o'clock hour. Reporting live, Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. All right, thank you, Dylan. Another Bear County race we are watching this evening is the contest for district attorney. Candidates Mark LaHood and incumbent DA Joe Gonzalez making stops at polling locations today. Our Erica Hernandez spoke with both as they made their last push. Over the past couple of weeks, the race for Bear County district attorney has heated up. Current District Attorney Joe Gonzalez seeking re-election. I'm hoping to get across the finish line. Uh, I, I would like uh, for us to have a, a sizable uh, lead uh, with the early vote uh, numbers that will come in. His opponent, Republican Mark LaHood, who specializes in criminal defense, personal injury law, probate issues, and family law, feeling good today and expecting the race to be close. Disclaimer, I'm not an expert, but if we come in the general election tied or ahead, I think it looks pretty good for us. I mean, obviously today will, the numbers today will determine that, but it feels good. Overall, both say if the numbers don't look in their favor, they will respectfully concede. You know, I respect the will of the voters. I think that if it looks like uh, the voters have a different mandate, uh, I will respect that. And one thing both candidates were excited about was seeing voter turnout. Both happy to see long lines at each of the polling sites they visited today. Now, we will be swinging by each of their watch parties tonight. One of them right here at the backyard on Broadway. Now, we will have full results for you on this race later tonight. Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. All right, we're in the final hour, final 53 minutes of voting for this midterm election. If you have not voted yet, get out there. As long as you're in line by the time polls close at 7 p.m., you will get to cast your ballot. You can scan this QR code to get the full list of all 302 voting locations. You can also find out which locations have been the least busy. Still time. Now, don't forget our election live stream starts right after this newscast. We're actually going to have a preview of what you can expect and introduce you to our power panel. <laughs> I'm going to say it like that power Full panel power. during this newscast. It's coming up in our next half hour. And now exclusive video of the aftermath of a Sunday night hit and run in which District 10 City Councilman Clayton Perry is a suspect. A viewer who passed the scene after it happened sent us this video of the smashed up car which police believe Perry hit while making the turn off Jones Maltzberger onto Redland Road in a Jeep Wrangler. A redacted police report, which sources confirmed was about Councilman Perry, says a witness followed that Wrangler, which left the scene, and when an officer checked it out, he found the Jeep parked against the garage with Perry lying injured in the backyard and smelling of alcohol. 
The officer seemed unable at that point to confirm that Perry had been the driver and left the scene. However, a later conversation with the witness seemed to help police decide Perry was believed to have been in a hit and run. The mayor says, quote, if the details in the police report regarding Sunday night are accurate, Councilman Perry should resign, end quote. Perry's office had no comment. The councilman has not yet been charged. New at six, besides who did it, a big question tonight is why? Why would someone set off an explosion beneath a sculpture right near the new San Pedro Creek Culture Park? It was caught on camera. Jesse DeGoyado says it has a lot of people talking and not just investigators. After being cleared a day earlier, the crime scene tape had gone back up as investigators with San Antonio Police and the Arson Bureau worked the area where an explosion had ripped a large hole beneath a giant head of linen. We now know the blast was powerful enough to shatter the windows at a nearby vacant building under renovation. It's believed the suspect used cinder blocks like these and then stacked them over there by the fence so he could jump over more easily. Surveillance video captured him approaching the sculpture, place a box at its base, then calmly walk away. Six minutes later. Boom, that was a big, oh my God, that was a big one. It's hard to believe that that would have happened here. Although Galindo's initial reaction wasn't about the vandalism itself. Why would a statue of Lenin be here in America, but especially here in San Antonio? On loan since March, as part of Central San Antonio's Art Everywhere initiative, the sculpture of Lenin's head with a feminine Chairman Mao perched on top had gone undisturbed until the early hours of Monday morning. Why it was vandalized is unknown. Who knows? That's a lot of crazies around right now. Seems like somebody just wanted to set up a bomb and then just found a reason to do it. Jealousy of culture and heritage, history, <laughs> stupidity. Central San Antonio says despite the damage, and there is no word on when or where it will go from here. Jesse De Goyado, KSAT 12 News. Check out Transguide right now. This is 410 and Fredericksburg, and I believe it's the westbound traffic that you see heading towards us that's backed up at this hour. No major accidents to tell you about. It's just very busy on this Tuesday election night. And up next, we are talking about the race for Texas governor. We have crews on both ends of the state. We're checking in live with our crews covering the camps for Governor Greg Abbott and his challenger Beto O'Rourke after the break. A key race that not only the entire state, but the entire nation is watching is the race for Texas governor, Republican incumbent Greg Abbott versus Democratic challenger Beto O'Rourke. Each candidate having watch parties on opposite sides of the state. O'Rourke's watch party in far west Texas in his hometown of El Paso. Our Alicia Badetta is covering his campaign tonight. And governor Abbott, meanwhile, having a watch party in McAllen. That's where we find our John Paul Barajas. Let's go live to John Paul first with some insight on why the governor chose that location instead of where he usually is in Austin. John Paul. Steve Myra, the decision to have the watch party here in McAllen is all part of the incumbent's plan to retain the GOP's stronghold here in the state. As for the party, that hasn't started just yet. Those doors will open at 7 o'clock right now. It's just a bunch of media and that empty stage behind me. Now, as for this region, it is uh, predominantly Democratic, but uh, Republicans are trying to change that, and they're making progress in doing so. And winning the Hispanic vote will have a major impact on how this governor's race is decided. On top of that, we're just, just a few miles from the border and securing the border, one of the governor's biggest pitches to voters at a time we're seeing record-breaking numbers of crossings. According to U.S. Customs and Border Protection, they've seen a 35,000 encounter increase compared to this time last year. This is the governor has spent millions busting migrants out of the state. McAllen also happens to be where the governor announced his re-election bid last January. And as polls on Election Day have nearly come to a close, poll projections have Abbott keeping his seat. If that happens, Texas Democrats will have over 200 straight statewide election losses. A victory for Abbott means a third term and also secures him as the second longest serving governor of the state. John Paul Barajas, KSAT 12 News. All right, thank you.
Let's go to the other end of Texas to El Paso when the Beto O'Rourke election night watch party. He's in West Texas tonight, but O'Rourke actually started the day out at a polling site here in San Antonio. Yeah, but let's check in live now with Alicia Barrera. She's in El Paso to tell us what the days leading up to Election Day have been like for the Democratic nominee. Alicia. <laughs> Good evening. Well, a lot of traveling across the street, across the state, hosting town halls in rural cities, colleges, big cities. I mean, he was just in San Antonio this morning and he's been documenting every single move on social media, which could be to his benefit, especially when we talk about the younger voters. But of course, the final say will be at the polls. So San Antonio today, he posted a picture of his visit there with support from Congressman Joaquin Castro, Mayor Ron Nirenberg, District Attorney John Gonzalez, as well as Texas Senator Roland Gutierrez. And their mission is to turn Texas blue. However, the most recent poll conducted between November 2nd and November 1st by CWS Research, that shows that Abbott has an 11 point lead over O'Rourke. But that hasn't discouraged the Democratic candidate just today. He also made stops in Houston. He was there about an hour ago. Uh, he was in San Marcos yesterday and then the Dallas, North Texas area earlier this week for that final push on the campaign trail, promising to expand Medicaid, also increasing teacher pay. We heard that during the debate, raising the minimum wage. Gun control is also a key item for or work, as well as restoring reproductive freedom for women. And this race has definitely drawn national attention. He has celebrity endorsements and donations from coast to coast, helping or work break fundraising records. But those at the polls will actually have the final say. Now, soon, we know he's making his way back to El Paso, his watch party, the stage is set. We've been hearing music all afternoon, and that's set to start here very soon. But before then, he announced on social media that he'll be making a visit to a local polling location at one of the elementary schools, just about 15 minutes away from there, from here, and then we should expect him early this evening. For now, live in El Paso, Alicia Barrera, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Alicia. Now, now is the time to use your phone to scan this QR code for all the latest on the midterm elections. Remember, polls close at 7 p.m. If you're in line by then, you will still get to vote. Our midterm election coverage will continue in our next half hour. Well, we, of course, have a live stream starting in the second half hour of this newscast. That QR code will take you to where you need to go to watch it as well. Live stream with the power panel. The power panel. All right, but first we're going to take a look outside with live cam tonight. It's all about elections right now, but we got a cold front to watch for in the coming days, Adam. Oh, it's going to be a real deal cold front that's going to hit us on Friday. In the meantime, you look at a crossroads area, I-10 and 410, no precipitation. You look all across south and central Texas, not much in terms of rain, but the luck of the draw. South side of San Antonio and even parts of the west side all around all the way around to Alamo Ranch. You look at the radar and these are some good little downpours moving to the northwest at about 20 miles per hour and they're just training. They're following each other kind of like, you know, cars on a train. They follow each other and that's a good thing when it comes to overall rainfall accumulations. Uh, we'll pause this right here and take a look at the far west side. This is Alamo Ranch area just south of SeaWorld. Marbrock Road here 1604 and this is some heavy rainfall that they're seeing. As for total accumulation so far, and keep in mind it's still raining just here on the south side, and we still have a few more hours of uh, rainfall potential here. But as for rainfall so far, you get around 1604 here. This is a uh, far south side of Bear County, Somerset eastward, and we're looking at under an inch, but still some not bad accumulations, all things considered, a quarter of an inch. So we'll take whatever we can get. And again, it's still raining there with a few hours of opportunity left. Going ahead, Friday is actually our best shot at more numerous showers. And that's going to be for the afternoon and evening hours. We're thinking with that cold front that moves in. Here's the big picture, big upper level trough, this big dip in the upper level flow, that circulation, that's stirring things up. It's going to help pull a cold front through our neck of the woods on Friday, but also pull some cooler air our way. Of course, whenever you have a dip in the upper level flow, that draws the cooler air southward. Conversely, of course, the bump, the ridge, we're all used to that, the big blue H, that's where the warmth is. So underneath that high, you've got 70s down in the southern US, but 20s and even single digits underneath that trough. Yeah, parts of Montana at one degree right now. So the next couple of days, low 80s. Tomorrow, 83, Thursday, 83. Friday will fall through the 60s throughout the day. And check out the weekend. Ooh, get the ingredients, make some chili. We're talking temperatures, high temperatures 
in the upper 50s to right near 60 by Saturday. Tomorrow, though, it's more of the same of what we've been having. A few brief showers here and there, some dampness, especially in the morning. 20% chance of a rogue shower, 68 at 7 a.m. By noon, 78 degrees, then a high temperature of 83. Thursday, we do it all over again. Veterans Day Friday, not just cooler, but of course, the wind is going to pick up. It's a real deal fall cold front, so you'll notice the changes pretty quickly. The wind's going to pick up, and it's going to be pretty gusty all the way into Saturday as well. Look at Saturday morning, 48 degrees, then a high temperature of only 58 with some gusty winds. Sunday, we'll start the day at 44 then mostly cloudy right near 60. And notice how that cool air sticks around all the way through the middle part of next week. Going to be nice. Thanks, Adam. All right, UTSA back in the dome and hopefully going to continue their winning ways, Greg. Well, if you take a look at the odds on this game, yes, they should because they're favored by over two touchdowns. When we come back, more about how UTSA is taking on Louisiana Tech this Saturday in the Dome and getting player reaction to the injury of one of their own. And how disappointing is this season for Jimbo Fisher? He'll tell us coming up. The UTSA Roadrunners are once again the team to beat in Conference USA. Coming into their game against Louisiana Tech, the Roadrunners are 5-0 oh in Conference, 7-2 overall. And after their 44-38 double overtime victory over UAB, their first ever against the Blazers in Birmingham. Now, while Louisiana Tech is 2-3 and 3-6 and three and six overall, they are coming off a 40-24 victory over Middle Tennessee that snapped a three-game losing streak. One reason why the Roadrunners are 18.5-point favorites on Saturday. Today marked the first time we've been able to get reaction from players after head coach Jeff Trailer announced on Monday. Monday, they had lost star wide receiver J.T. Clark for the rest of the season after he tore his ACL and his right knee in Birmingham. Losing J.T. is, is huge. Um, Y'all know the, the playmaker he is, um, uh, how he attacks the ball when the ball's in the air, um, how he blocks uh, when the ball's not in his hand, um, his personality on the sideline. Uh, losing him is, is pretty big, so um, I feel like I, I got to do a, a good job of uh, keeping the team up. Um, just, just trying to, trying to, I guess substitute um, for the energy that that JT brought. Um, so yeah, it was pretty big. Nice yeah, and that injury looked a lot worse than a torn ACL, didn't it? Kickoff in the Alamo Dome on Saturday, except for 2:30 p.m. What a showdown set for this Saturday night when the undefeated number four ranked TCU Horn Frogs traveled to Austin to face the number 18 Texas Longhorns in a key game to decide, help decide the Big 12 championship. TCU is now 9-0 and in first place in the Big 12 standings while the Longhorns got themselves back in the race with their first road win of the season this past weekend, 34-27 against Kansas State to put them now at 4-2 in league play and 6-3 and overall just like Baylor. Last year, the Horns won at TCU 32-27 behind Bijan Robinson's career high of 216 yards rushing. Maybe one reason why the Horns are seven point favorites on Saturday. But after scoring 31 points in the first half against the Wildcats, the Horns only scored three in the second half. Can head coach Steve Sarkeesian put his finger on the recurring problem? Too many self-inflicted wounds, really on both sides of the ball. But you can't you can't have pre-snap penalties, you know, and then you can't have multiple pre-snap penalties in the same drive. You know, as we were taking, you know, two steps forward, we were taking one step backwards. And inevitably, you put yourself in third and long scenarios against a good defense, the, the game gets hard. All right, kickoff in Austin on Saturday night, except for 6.30 p.m. And you can see the Longhorns host the Horn Frogs live right here on KSAT 12. The Fighting Texas Aggies must win out in their remaining three games just to be bowl eligible now. That's because the Maroon and White have now lost five games in a row and have dropped to one and five in the SEC and three and six overall. Their troubles have already cost them a five-star recruit after the top-rated linebacker in the nation, Anthony Hill Jr., decommitted this week. Ains King started a quarterback at the 41-24 loss to Florida after a flu bug hit the team, including Connor Wegman. How frustrating has this season been for head coach Jimbo Fisher, who started the season as a six-ranked team in the country it's not frustrating it's disappointing you don't get frustrated you get frustrated you make bad choices you don't keep quit coaching you quit you know you look at different things for a different reason when you're disappointed you're reason why things are going wrong when where the problems are and you keep coaching your tail off and it's disappointing because you had a chance to have a good team you still have a chance to have a good team the Aggies go looking for their first road win against a team that is basically in the same boat as they are one and five in the SEC three and six overall when they face Auburn Saturday night at 6 30 and we broke it last night tonight we'll tell you again but our big game coverage concludes a live broadcast of the 6-8 division one playoff game 
between number 10 New Bravos and number 6 Reagan Rattlers live this Friday night from Comalander Stadium. Our pregame show starts at 6.30. Kickoff is around 7, about 7.08. And again, it's all live right here on KSAT 12. So we're kind of picking up where we left off with the KSAT Pigskin Classic and now bringing you a playoff game live on a Friday night. A pretty big deal. Yeah, it's big a great deal. deal. Yeah. And a pretty big game. And uh, thanks to Adam, now we deal with weather as well. Yeah, uh, that's always <laughs> exciting, isn't it? Yeah, sure. Thanks, All right, Greg. Thanks, Greg. We're kicking off our conversation with our political power panel up next. Power panel.